Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, brought to you by HypeBot.com. Thank you to Bruce and everybody at HypeBot for everything you do to support the podcast and the music industry. Jay, I'm really excited to let you know we've got a awesome special guest that I'm really, really proud do. to have. Who we, do we have today, Michael? We have J.J. French joining us. And, and J.J., J, J, I mean, everybody's got to know your history. Do you encounter anybody who's like, who's J.J. French? Well, you know, that's a very funny question because <laughs> um, I live in Manhattan and I live in, you know, in the neighborhood with a lot of uh, movie stars and TV stars on the Upper West Side, and nobody pays any attention to anybody, which is the way it should be. You know, we all kind of run into each other at the grocery stores, and whether we know someone or not, there's a little silent nod, because this is the way it is. Right. In New York City, nobody really cares. But one day, I was <laughs> sitting on a brownstone stoop, checking my emails, and a guy walks by me. He goes, hey, you know what? You look just like this guy, J.J. French. <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, Really? I said, who's that? He goes, you know, a guy in Twisted Sister. God, anybody ever tell you you look just like him? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, nobody ever said I look like him. He says, you do, man. You got to go online. TwistedSister.com. Check it out. Or their Facebook page, man. You look just like that guy. And I said, oh, okay. Thanks. I never said anything. Okay, that's, that's one instance. And then this is how humble you really need to be, especially in New York. But just to give you an illustration of how humble... I am. I say it in the most humbling, narcissistic way. I'm in a Starbucks in Midtown, my daughter one day, and some 20-year-old barrister punk with a, you know, backwards baseball cap making me coffee. He says, you know, yo, man, I didn't know you lived around here. And I went, uh, so first of all, I thought he was talking to somebody standing behind me because, you know, I don't really like to be recognized. And I don't really care. So I look behind me, there's nobody there. So I say, excuse me, you, you, you talking to me? He goes, yeah, man. I didn't know you lived around here. I said, who do you think I am? He goes, you keep a subtle, right? And <laughs> you said, yep. Uh, so, so that's another example. And then maybe the funniest thing I can tell you is that back in the bar days, we did crazy shit, as people know, to like entertain ourselves. That's why the band in the documentary tells the story about the long slog through the bars because we were working five nights a week for 10 years. And, you know, we would get bored and do crazy shit. And we developed all sorts of shtick, like the death of disco thing. And, you know, we taunted the son of Sam for a year when he was killing people. And there's all sorts of craziness that went around. Well, one night we're playing this bar in Westchester and some guy's yelling, hey, you know, man, you're not loud enough. And meanwhile, we're playing a small bar with like three Marshall stacks, right? It's so fucking loud. I mean, it's like an SST at takeoff. So this guy's got to be really hammered on something for him not to think it's loud. He's heckling us. Hey, man. So I said, come here, asshole. And he comes on stage. And when a guy comes on stage to challenge us, me, D, and Mark, especially when we were wearing six-inch heels, we like stand six, seven. It's very intimidating. Most guys come up on stage and they're standing in the middle of us and go, oh, shit, I'm really sorry, man. I'm, I'm really sorry. So the guy gets on stage, and I go, what's your problem? You're not loud enough. I said, okay. I took him by the hair. I jam his head against a Marshall stack. And I'm holding it, playing an E chord, like an E note. I said, loud enough? And he goes, uh, he goes, no, man, not loud enough. You, you guys still there? Cause it's so yeah, no, no, we're here. Sure. We're here. We're here. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. So he goes, still not loud enough. So I tell him. I said, spread your arms out like Jesus Christ. And he does. And I had my road crew duct tape this dude to the Marshall stack, like in, <laughs> like in the Jesus pose. Okay, nice. so now the guy is duct taped with his arms spread on the Marshall stack. And I'm thinking to myself, how fucking crazy is this guy? Like, how wrecked does he have to be? And I, I'm thinking he's going to be begging to be released. And I look around every, it's a whole set. I look around like, He's got a big smile on his face, thumbs up, like, this is the greatest night of his fucking life. I'm thinking, shit just gets crazy, you know? So we do a whole set, and we let him off, you know? And okay, fine. I go, I say to myself, okay, chalk that up to some crazy exper you know, experience one night. A couple of years ago, I'm walking through Grand Central Station in New York. Guy comes up to me, hey, it's J.J. French, man. Hey, 
Hey, man. Hey, remember that place, uh, the four and a half, the White Plains? Remember that night you taped that dude to your, <laughs> your Marshall back? I go, yeah, was it you? He goes, no, that was my best friend. I said, really? How's he doing? He goes, he still tells people that's the best night of his life. So, and I said, is he mad with kids? And he goes, yeah. And I said, it's still the best night of his life? Tell him to go to a therapist, okay? Because that shit's a little off the wall. So anyway, those are nice. my two recognized JJ right. Francis. So, so I don't so, assume so, so, so anybody J knows or cares. So JJ, you obviously you've you've been in the music business for a long time. You've been on stage, behind the stage, because you've managed in, in the past. We'd like to kind of pick your brain and get your opinion of where things stand for the future going forward in this new industry, especially for heritage acts, acts that came up through the 70s, the 80s, even the 90s. Who they sold music, they sold merch, they toured their butts off. What what what's the new the new music business hold in the future for these classic heritage bands? Well, the classic heritage bands are in a great position. Um, back in the classic original real days, you made no money on tour, but you made money selling records. Now you make no money selling records, but you make money on tour. Hence the price of tickets. You have to remember. Or maybe you don't, or maybe I'm so old, I will scare the crap out of people. But when I used to be seeing Zeppelin and Hendrick, uh, you know, at the Fillmore, the tickets were $3, okay? And right. if you couldn't afford the three bucks, you went to the Schaefer Festival in Central Park, the tickets were a dollar and a dollar fifty. If you couldn't afford the dollar, a dollar fifty, you sat outside because it was so loud, you didn't have to see the band anyway. And that was the, that was the economics of the day. Um... I know that in those days, typically the bands were getting paid. Top shelf bands, Cream, The Who, they're making $750 a night. You know, $500 a night, $1,000 a night on their first tour. When I saw the Stones for the first time in 69, tickets were six bucks. So it's an economy of scale. Now to keep it in perspective, um, you know, your salary back in those days, I was uh, 17, 18 working in a hardware store making 70 bucks a week and probably selling some weed on the side, you know, to supplement <laughs> my income. Plus I was, you know, ahead of my time selling weed and I was entrepreneurial. I could tell back then it was going to be a big industry. So my girlfriend was making 90 bucks a week as receptionist. We had a nice apartment on the east side. The apartment cost 80 bucks a month. Everything was proportionally scalable. Shows are $3, $4. You know, weed was $15 an ounce, uh, $100 a pound, $150 for a kilo. I mean, I used to sound like my grandfather. <laughs> when I was a boy, we, we had charcoal. We walked to school. But in fact, you know, gas was $0.28 cents a gallon. I mean, it was a different world. Now everything is multiplied by a zillion times. And uh, you're still not getting paid more <laughs> than a certain amount of money. So uh, bottom line is classic rock fans are, uh, deliver a, uh, a good feeling to their fans. They charge a lot of money. Hopefully, there's enough original members to make it worthwhile or at least sound equivalent to what you need to be. And you make a lot of money. The so classic bands are in a much better shape. The real crisis, the real crisis really is the replenishment of the rock world by young people. And that, I think, we're in serious uh, danger. That's where the crisis really comes. So you, 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 you don't think there's... There's no future coming behind these heritage bands that are going to be filling filling sheds. Well, I use this as an example, and if you guys think I'm wrong, please tell me. When I was 17, Zeppelin, the Stones, the Who's Zepp, Floyd, Janis Joplin, Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan, Hendrix, none of those guys were older than 25. Think about this for a second. I'm 17, 18. My heroes are 25 years old, and there's thousands of them. Filling, uh, you know, filling giant festivals around the country, around the world. The Moody Blues, uh, Pink Floyd, you name it. They're like 24, right. 25, 26. I'm 17. Great. Now, you go to these festivals around the world, and everybody's 65 years old. All the band members are 65. If I told my mother when I was 17, if I was going to Giant Stadium to see an act that was average age of 65, she'd look at me like I was definitely taking too much ass. <laughs> 
Like, you know, yeah. what am I seeing? The Dorsey brothers? You know, am I seeing the Glenn Miller Orchestra? <laughs> Who the fuck would be 65 years old? So when I'm on stage and White Snake, Def Leppard, Judas Priest, Kiss, you know, they're all like mid 60s. Then you got the Rolling Stones, who I call them the Flintstones at this point. You know, they're like, they're so fucking old. Their fans don't clap because they're afraid the lights will go on in the arena. I mean, we're talking like <laughs> nice <laughs> another level. Of, we're talking about, you know, and trying to, and what besides which, trying to watch Keith and Ronnie Wood play guitars like being driven in a tour bus by Jose Feliciano and Ray Charles without a GPS. Fucking nightmare. I mean, I don't know how they know where. If you got to look to Ronnie Wood to know when you're beginning and ending a song, you're fucking, you're, you're like out there. So I don't even understand how the Stones function because they used to be the greatest rock band in the world back in the 60s and 70s, which I saw them many times. And you can see them on DVD from Ladies and Gentlemen of the Rolling Stones. You'll see a band that's arguably the greatest live rock band in the world, but not anymore. But having said that, the, the, the priests, the kisses, all these guys, they're all like 65 years old. You know, Kiss is near 70 from what I, I think. So that's bizarre. So that's, that's the problem. Where's the 25-year-old rock star? Can you guys name me five current big-selling rock bands whose average age is 25? Can you name no. me five? No, and no. no, and there's not okay, even so, very many guitars so, being sold anymore. I mean, look, Gibson right. went out of business. So, Guitar Center's well, in trouble. Well, Gibson's not going out of business. Kids is not going out of business. They, they're, they're a reorganization because of bad management. They'll always be around. But the point being, there's A, no guitar heroes for real. And B, there's no 25-year-old rock star. So when people say to me, you're a naysayer, man. Rock is, is great. I say, okay, perfect. Give me, give me five big-selling, arena-filling rock bands that are 25 years old. Please, give me one. You can't name one. Therefore, it's in trouble. Now, whether or not I am upset about it, well, that's another question. That's a broader philosophical question because, you know, everything has a beginning and an end. Rock has been, rock music has been a viable force for 50 years. That's a hell of a run. I'm not so sure that it has to continue or it will. I mean, look, a lot of people don't like hip hop. Hip hop may be the voice of a generation. It's not my voice. But then again, the Beatles weren't my father's voice. My right. father thought it sucked. My father thought everything after 1943 sucked. He used to say to me, your music sucks. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, it's all baby, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. All. I said, boy, it's so simple for you to dismiss an entire genre. Thousands of he goes, because it sucks. He goes, you know, it's not Stravinsky. It's not Schubert's Mass and F minor. It's not, that's music. And, I, and you know what? Is he wrong? Not really. It's generational. What you fall in love with from the age of 13 and 20 is usually what you right. fall in love with for the rest of your life. And, and I tend to think that the ubiquitousness of hip hop, um, to a certain degree, country, only what country sounds like 80s metal with a twang. Exactly. Really what country is mm -hmm. these days. Sure. Anyway, pop. with a, um, yeah, it's pop. It's, it's, it's Def Leppard with a twang. That's exactly what country, <laughs> contemporary country music sounds like to me. But outside of that, I think this is what we're really dealing with at this point. So, so JJ, what do you think got us to the point where we don't have the that next generation of rock stars ready to pick up the mantle and, and you know wave the flag? What what happened? Well, don't you think you should ask a twenty five year old that question seriously? Right? Why are you ask? I mean, I don't mean to be. I mean, you know, I'm 65. I've seen it all in my, in my, in, to me, I've seen everything I need to see. I've experienced just about every act you can possibly imagine because these, besides Twisted Sisters 9,000 shows, there's the other 2,000 that I saw, the Fillmore, you know, plus Elvis, plus Sinatra, plus, sure. and, you know, Beck with Stewart, Beck with Rod Stewart, the faces, um, the Stones a billion times, hundreds of billion times, Zeppelin is an opening act, the Grateful Dead a jillion times, the airplane, the who, Pink Floyd, you name it, saw it all. Um, the answer would be more in the um, coming out of a 25-year-old than it would be me. Maybe the 25-year-old not listening to, you know, I, I, and I get, by the way, people say, no, you don't understand, man, my kid loves the Beatles. No, you don't understand, my kid loves Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I get that they do. 
but they also have the peer pressure of all these other musical acts that you may not like. I had this conversation the other day with a 20 year old kid. And I said, you like the Beatles? Yeah. I said, I have to hear from them. my parents. I said, how many of your friends like them? There's some. Okay, okay. But what do you really, you know, what do your friends play? And they named me Drake. You know, all the big hip hop artists. And I go, you like them? He goes, yeah, it's okay. In other words, I'm not being that judgmental. They're just accepting it as the pop music of the day. And the pop music of the day has a great effect. Now, there's a documentary that I am in called What is Classic Rock? And it's a question asked by a young filmmaker in Canada who's looking for the answer of what is classic rock? Exactly. Um, what does it encompass? Where did it start? And they asked me for my opinion. And as I'm watching the other guys give their responses to this question, I'm kind of sensing that there's this um, melancholy for where's the great white four-piece rock band, you know, or five-piece rock band that's going to save us, that's going to save the world. And I'm thinking to myself, it's that's such crap. It shouldn't have to save the world. It is what it is. It means like if you love Skinner and the Allen Brothers and the Grateful Dead and the Who and Floyd, and, then enjoy them. Enjoy them. And don't worry about it. And whatever generation comes up with, I don't need to come up with the ultimate answer. I really don't. And I don't think it's a fair question because it assumes all sorts of biases that I prefer not to, not to, not that I prefer not to extrapolate on, but I prefer to think are irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Um, you know, ask Bobby Vinton, Bobby Goldsboro, Elvis Presley, Steve Lawrence, in 1964, when the Beatles hit, ask them what they thought of the Beatles. They're probably going to tell you that Liverpool put them out of business. Was it fair to them? Probably not, but who cares? Life goes on. So, you know, uh, Sinatra put King Crosby out of business. Elvis put Sinatra out of business. The Beatles put Elvis out of business. Yeah. And on and on and on and on. And it's just life. Well, JJ, what when somebody says, and you read this all the time online, the internet killed that the future rock stars. It's the internet's fault that we don't have those big artists anymore. Is that is that a fair statement for someone to make? Well, if that's the case, then um, Louis Fonsi and Daddy Yankee just had the biggest song of all time in history. Like four billion YouTube hits didn't hurt them, did it? So all these, they're just excuses. It's like the question should be, why isn't the music we're creating making people excited? That should be the question. Not that we're being exploited because someone's being exploited. You can hate Lady Gaga, she's massive. You can hate Taylor Swift, she's massive. You know, if you think about it, the pathway for rock bands sucks. Pathway for female pop artists is huge. The pathway for country artists is huge. Pathway for hip hop artists is huge. Pathway for rap artists. The question isn't, did internet and downloading kill rock bands? The question is, how did they foster and make those acts bigger? Pretty simple. Yeah. Did 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 the did the record labels give up on fostering rock bands? Well, that's a question people say. Oh, the labels are conspiring. Labels don't conspire. Labels are greedy fucking bastards. They'll sell anything to their mothers. They don't give a shit. They'll sell whatever popular. You know. So they needed to be convinced that the Beatles were popular, and then they were. Then they became popular. They need to be convinced. You know, there's got to be an underground swell. There has to be some underground vibe. Nobody killed anything. There's a general change of, of command, a change in the guard. I mean, people look for these other answers, like, what's wrong with my kid? He likes this. There's nothing wrong with your kid. The kid's your kid. He hears what he hears, and he decides what he wants to decide. And just because the Beatles saves your life doesn't mean he has to save their life. Look, my daughter, at some point, I think she was eight or nine, comes into my office and says, Daddy, listen to this. And she plays me... I think it's Britney Spears' version of Satisfaction or something, you know? And of course, I throw up automatically. <laughs> and I think to myself, okay, this is a teaching moment. And I play her the Rolling Stones version. I said, this, by the way, arguably is the greatest single ever recorded. It's you know, critically acclaimed. A song that means so much to me, my generation. Undeniably classic great. I play her the Stones version. She goes, that sucks, Daddy. Now, at that <laughs> moment, had I murdered her, a jury of my peers could have found me innocent of infantile, of the fantasy. 
Of course they should listen. That's a fucking stupid statement. But in reality, what it made me do is come to terms with respect what she wants to hear. Of course, I tied it down and tased her for the next of few years. <laughs> the Beatles became the number one band, and I set her ass fucking straight. But in reality, you know, you accept it for what it is. And so I accept it for what it is. So I don't bemoan things. You know, if the world isn't thinking that there's some guitar heroes, there's no shortage of insane guitar players. And you go online, and the level of expertise is crazy. But you should have a song connected to all that fucking Ingve bullshit that you're throwing out there, all that, you know, that regurgitated nonsense scale yeah. stuff, which is fun from a technical standpoint. It certainly beats out everything that I had. I mean, when I was 17, 18, A, a we had no internet. B, we had records with nickels taped on the top, and you had to keep playing the song over to learn a guitar solo. And you had Danny Calvin, and Mike Bloomfield, Eric Clapton, and then it evolved into um, uh, probably Alvin Lee 10 years after was a hot guitar singer. Obviously, Hendrix broke the mold and established the world. And we all cared, and it mattered. And Do you now, think that... Oh, go ahead. The ultimate democracy. There's an ultimate democracy out there. You throw it all out there. You tell yeah. me. No one's forcing. No one forced the world to listen to a uh, Despacito. Nobody forced the world to listen to right. Gangnam Style. Nobody did. It went out there. So why did Gangnam Style get? Well, why did why did Carl Ray Jepsen get 800 million YouTube hits, and they thought that would never be topped? And then Gangnam Style comes out. It gets right. 2.3 billion YouTube hits. And then, you know, that's just, you know, no one forces you to listen to it. Right. You don't want to listen to it, you don't listen to it. But damn it, it just yeah. radiates and it causes a worldwide sensation. Do you Wouldn't think you that the plane? configuration has anything to do with that? Because when we were growing up, we had to work a little bit harder <clears throat> to either listen to the radio when it came on or go to retail and buy something. Nowadays, everything's right there on this portable device in their hands. They don't really have the same engagement. Uh, necessarily with the music. Not true. Judas Priest and all these bands, all these classic bands that continue to release new music, if it's all that great, why isn't it? It's available on every platform that these other artists are on. Right? right. Every one of them. Right. The minute you release a new record, your record label is putting it on every possible platform in the world. You're just as available as Desposito. Yeah. So if, if, so if Desposito is getting 4.1 billion hits on YouTube, and your new video is getting 100,000, and it's all available for the same price, which is free, then what are you saying exactly? Right. You know, with me, you kind of hit this. I'm sorry I'm the voice of reality here, but I am the voice of reality. I study this stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, classic rock artists are interesting because classic rock artists are in good shape. We have careers that we didn't think we would have because the 80s are so revered by a certain demographic. And those demographics will take big money now, and which is wonderful. We have lives. The biggest mistake the classic rock bands do is make a new record. That's not the mistake. The mistake is playing it live when nobody cares. And you know what? I don't want to hear the crap. Hey, man, you live in the past. You know, bullshit. Uh, you charge 350 bucks for a ticket, you damn straight you live in the past. You want to hear every hit that person puts out. So if the choice is the artist you're watching is playing 20 songs that you know or 15 songs you know and five you don't, you just got ripped off. I don't care. It's all crap. So the 2 or 3% who go, hey, man, I want to hear new, that's fine. You want to make your fans happy, you play the hits and you play them every night and you play them perfectly and you play them with the same feeling. Why? Very simple. Ray Davies from the Kinks was asked years ago, are you sick of playing? You really got me. And he said, seriously. Here's my choice. Play You Really Got Me or Flip Hamburgers. Are you fucking serious? Right. Okay. Right. So, right. So, I mean, you're paying me a shitload of money to play I Want to Rock and we're not going to take it? I'm the happiest motherfucker in the world to play those songs. Happy. Right. Every night. Thrilled to death that those are worldwide hits. And by the way, they are the most licensed songs in the history. In the history of all 80s rock music. We're not going to take it as in more movies, TV, soundtracks. We are the number one one most licensed music band for the 80s, which means these songs resonate. And when people say to me, what's our legacy, or I hate Twisted Sister, or The Buzz, or a bunch of this, I go, fine, whatever. Except that we have the number one protest song in the world, sung in every country, redone in multiple languages. The teacher strikes all around the country, they all sang, we're not going to take it. 
Anyway, we are not stupid. We play the hits. When you see Twisted Sister, you get the hits. If I put up a big sign at the concert, let's say we project it on a big screen. Okay, kids, we're playing 20 songs. Here's the 20. But we'll take two of these out, put two new ones in. Let's vote. What do you think the vote would be, guys? What do you seriously think the vote would be? So everybody's going to want the hits? Of course. 95% of the people. Well, you're an entertainer, which means your responsibility is to the, is to the buying public. I don't buy this shit. I do it for me. I rearrange the songs to make it interesting. Fuck that. I mean, really, that's fine. Look, it's a free country. You know, as long as you're not selling heroin to school kids, you can make whatever fucking dumb choices you want. That's your business. But to me, you are entertainers. When you charge a lot of money for a ticket, you give the people what they want. And you give it to them the way they want to hear. You don't get cute. You don't get stupid. Now, you can be my guest. You know, maybe maybe your lead singer can't sing anymore. Maybe he's got to use all sorts of tricks. Maybe he has to ghost his vocals from the drummer because his voice is shot and you want to sell that kind of shit to somebody. That's your choice. I can't tell you how many classic bands are unable to perform. They're still out there selling their shit and they can't really do it for this. Right? You know, at the end of the day, guys, I'm sorry if I sound out of breath. I'm actually doing my power walk on doing this thing. That's why I'm kind of taking down to this thing. I walk every day. Right now. So, um, I don't care what the fans are. And if the fans buy it, that's great. But I'll give you an example. We were doing a festival, a really great metal festival, um, about 10 years ago in Holland. And this is a one-day festival. Tickets were 80 euros. Check out the lineup. Kansas, Ario Speedwagon, Motorhead, Journey, Death Leopard, Twisted Sister, and Kiss. In one day. That's huge, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Everyone, everybody plays an hour. I think Kiss played an hour and a half. One of the bands, well, not named, I'm standing there watching them play. And there's a couple of guys in front of me who obviously had seen the band a couple of times that year in Europe. And one of the guys says to the other guy, after the next song, the singer is going to turn to the left and say, blah, blah, blah. Exactly what he does. He goes, after the next song, he's going to turn to the right. He's going to say, blah, blah, blah. He does exactly that. I'm thinking to myself. So these guys are so freaking lazy that they do, they interact with the audience the same way. See, here's the difference. Twisted Sister plays the songs perfectly, but we talk to our audience uniquely that night we make him feel special because we're entertainers and how did we learn that we learned it in the bars we learned it from from discipline i write for ink magazine you guys may be aware i write a mm-hmm. business column for ink yep. my new one is just posted it's called wash rinse repeat there's a lesson here so pay attention here's the lesson this is what usually happens when a musician comes up to me hey jj man i want you to come see my band i go okay how long have you been together two years cool how many shows you played? Oh, man, about 50. I go, oh, that's cool. How long is your set? Oh, anywhere from like a half hour to 45 minutes. I say, oh, great. I say, okay, here's the deal. When you get to 500 shows, call me. 500? You're never going to get to that. My response, well, chances are I ain't going to go see your band. Okay, because here's Twisted Sister statistics for our first two years, 1973-74. Number of nights played, 396. Number of performances played, 1,900 and change. Number of hours, life about 4,500 hours. Number of rehearsals, 150 in those two years. Number of hours of rehearsing, 750. Add that in. Total hours of performance time in the first two years. In other words, I'm 20 and 21 years old. 6,600 hours worth of performance time. That's how you become great. And until you do that, I ain't interested. Because I know what it takes to be great. When you watch a documentary, where it's just a fucking sister, you will understand. So if you don't know the band, you're not aware of the history of the band, it may behoove you to see it and understand why, after 45 years, the band could stand up in front of 100,000 people like it's nothing and put on a show. Because, guys, how many bands exist on this earth that can play to 100,000 people where the promoters have total faith? There's maybe 15 act in the world where a promoter will trust 100,000 people. We're one of them. 
because we learn how to entertain. We learn how to be great. We learn the discipline. It's not pretty. It's not sexy. It's business. To coin the godfather phrase, it's business, Sonny. Purely business. I, JJ, I love that. It's it's business. I think so many, so many people, young musicians, forget that it's a business, and and that that sets them back behind all the comp, the competition that does realize it. You've got to remember what's what's the old saying? It's 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 the music business. There's seven letters in business. There's only five letters in music. The business is more important. Not only that, it's, uh, the phrase sex, drugs, and rock and roll is missing one phrase. It's called money. That's because most of the musicians are fucking dumbass, and they don't follow the money. Yep. So I was always a money guy, always a business guy. Look, you can hate Gene Simmons all you want. Sometimes he throws his Trumpian bullshit a little bit too far and makes you nauseous because he puts it in your face. I don't put it to your face. I'll just say we were, we were calculating and smart. I'm not going to go, hey, man, I'll make the richest and biggest and best because that's not, that's not important. What I'm saying, Gene had a good business sense. Very smart man. And um, their brand is huge. Uh, their brand second to us in terms of licensing songs, but certainly the most branded band in the world. You can hate him. Gene was smart. And Gene always tells you, don't be stupid. It's business, man. Someone's got to be in charge. Someone has to understand it. I was one of those guys. I did get it. I understood it. And, and to my, the credit to my guys, who all work hard. I mean, he is arguably... I think he's the greatest front man in the world. So uh, you can't, don't throw me out as David Lee Roth. Don't, none of those guys can hold a candle to D in his discipline. None of them, not even close. The discipline every day of his working life that I've been together with him, he does two hours of vocal warm-ups every day. The man don't mess around. He is on, the, on point every night. Mark Mendoza on bass every night. He delivers. Eddie O.J. that delivers. A.J. Pirro until his untimely death. One of the greatest drummers in the world, certainly our John Bonham, and our replacement Mike Portnoy, who's an absolute genius on drums, and pays ultimate respect to AJ by playing AJ's parts and not doing his prog stuff, which he does so masterfully. Um, we represent a level of excellence. We believe in the excellence of execution. It's very, very, very important to us. But getting back to the business part of it, I'm proud that we're a smart business. And 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 th- and that's why you've got the most licensed songs out there from the '80s because you realize that. That's right, right. J- JJ, that's we could right. we we could go on forever here, but um, I got to wrap up. I want to give you an opportunity to plug whatever you want to plug. Where can people find out more about you? Follow what you're doing. Um, what what do you want to push? Well, I write for many publications. Plus, I have a book deal, so I have a book out hopefully within the next year, about Twisted My Life. I don't know what it's going to be called yet. But I write for three magazines. You can read my writing all the time. It's all available. I write a Beatle column for Goldmine Magazine because I'm a Beatleologist. I'm a specialist, and an expert, and they allow me to write interesting stories of the Beatles that I find fascinating, stuff that matters to me. And the Beatles matter to me. They're in my genome. They're in my life. They're part of my life. Um, they're the reason why I, I want to be a rock star. As to many other people, but to me, they are as great as they are in the world. I always think they're speaking to me when I listen to their records. That's maybe one of the greatest things about them. I think they're really talking to me, even though I know they're talking to millions, but they're just, so I read a Beatle column for Goldmine. And the, one of the column is called Now We're 64. Sorry, that's in every other month at Goldmine. I write a, an audio column for an audio magazine called G-O-P-E-R. Copper is access to P.S. Audio, which is a high-end audio company. P is in Peter, S is in Stan. P.S. Audio. If you go on their website, you'll see Copper Magazine. Hit it. You'll see all these covers of the online magazine. Just touch a cover. A little hamburger will give you the authors. My articles are called Twisted System. And I just talk about music or audio equipment because I also have an audio file and I have a Fine. huge audio system and I'm a specialist. I write a business column for Inc. Magazine. That's the online business column. This is not Inc. as in Tattoo. It's Inc. as in Incorporated. I-N-C dot C-O-M. It's an online business magazine, Inc.com. If you put in J.J. French, J-A-Y-J-A-Y-F-R-E-N-C-H slash Inc.com, hit the button. You will have access to all 45 of my business articles. 
I have a uh, speaking uh, company. I do motivational speaking. Um, you can hire me from my website. You can hire me through an email, frenchmgmt at gmail.com. That's French. And MGMT is short for management. Contact me from there and you can hire me. I do motivational speaking and business speaking. And I basically do it to corporations. Ironically, I got into it thinking it was going to be music-based, but it turns out not. I have done almost exclusively um, business advice. And it's interesting because what Twisted Sister went through, I'm able to distill it into life lessons. And I talk about it. So I'm hired by corporations to discuss business through the prism of rock and roll. I did very entertainingly. did a lot of good stories, a lot of good lessons there. So you can hire me as a motivational speaker through FrenchMGMT at gmail.com. And I have a book coming out. Twisted Sister has a new live album, Live at the Marquee, 1983. On vinyl coming out August 10th. Can't Stop Rock and Roll is being re-released on vinyl because vinyl is very, very big among classic bands. Thank God for that. That's coming out August 10th. There'll be a big uh, press release on that. Um, next year, we hope to release more live stuff that's ever been released. And, um, you know, 35th anniversary of Stay Hungry, and I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do for that. Are we going to reform? Maybe. I have no idea. I mean, we play a couple songs, we record a couple, we play live. I think it's all up in the air. Maybe yes, maybe no. But we certainly will recognize it as 35 years. It's an album that sold 6 million copies and brought the world. We're not going to take it and I want to rock. So there's, in a nutshell, uh, everything that I wish to promote as of today. So let, let, let me, as a huge fan of You Can't Stop Rock and Roll, which I, I think that album, to me, is your best album, and it still holds, it still holds up today. The, the vinyl release, re-release that's coming up, is there going to be any bonuses, anything special added to it? You know, I, I'm not, I don't think, I don't think so. This has, not been a, this has not been available on vinyl and certainly not a really remastered version of it. So you're going to have a remastered version. So hopefully the sound, well, I've, heard the, I've heard it sounds fantastic. And incidentally, it's my favorite record. And I believe he and I had conversations about this. That's Dee's favorite as well. It was, it was the last time the band was truly happy as a band and in the studio. Uh, was during the making of that record. We still had a, we still had a, a unity about the band that was that was take no prisoners, and that's what that what that's what brings me back to that record. So stay hungry, while obviously a game changer in our careers with um, the dual impact of MTV. I have to say the Can't Stop Rock and Roll is my favorite recording. Yeah, I I, I agree. It is just the to me, that's the Twisted Sister sound. That's the vibe. That's everything about that album was perfect. I love every song. I, I, we're going to make it. It's one of my favorite songs. Can't Stop Rock and Roll is one of my favorite songs. Um, great music. I want to leave you with this one thing, which I think you'll find kind of humorous. So years ago, VH1 contacted me to do a behind the music. No, no. Where are they now? JJ French thing. So the guy says to me, well, you know, you're a manager and you're a musician. That doesn't happen in one person, usually. What's that like? And he's correct. I only know of two manager musicians, one being Mick Fleetwood and Billy Mack, and the other being Steve Miller. And they are two very, very unique skill sets and are normally mutually exclusive. And in this case, um, I never thought about it until he asked me that question. And I said, here's my response. I said, well... When you go to a circus, usually all circuses end the same way. Elephants come out at the end, and they're walking in a big circle with the trunks holding the tails of the elephant in front of them. And behind the last elephant is a guy with a garbage can shoveling elephant shit. And I said, the guy shoveling the shit is the manager. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, the elephant, however, is the musician. So I've been both the elephant... So basically, ba basically you've been shoveling your own shit. Yes, <laughs> I can shovel my own shit and, and argue with myself about it. So, you know, you're right. JJ, this was awesome. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out from your morning and join us. And, and listen, the reality, that's what needs to happen. 
the reality's got to be slapped into some of these people today. I love the real talk. Thank so, you, guys. Thank, thank, thank you so much, and uh, en enjoy the rest of your day, JJ. <laughs>